So this past week was our semi-annual Fairview Early Childhood Center consignment sale. And for Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, they're setting up Wednesday night, uh, started setting stuff after supper. And then Thursday, Friday, and yesterday morning, uh, the fellowship hall was full of clothing and toys and all kinds of stuff that folks had donated uh, that other folks could come and purchase. And I, I, might, I might have gone overboard in buying cute uh, 3T size dresses for Isla. I think I bought more dresses than we have Sundays that she's going to fit into 3T dresses. And they're all summer ones too, so I we'll, we'll see what we do. But then we can just donate them back, right? And, and um, uh, fortunately we have enough places to put those dresses. But there were also some really great toys there, some of them pretty functional. Uh, for example, there was a table, a Crayola table for coloring, and she's really into coloring and painting right now. Uh, and the problem with getting that, we didn't get it, somebody else got it, was that I don't know where we'd put it. After we folded it up, we could put it somewhere, but to set it out, we don't, I don't know that we have a space to actually put it. And there was another toy that Isla really liked, as a giant bear. It's not as functional as the table, uh, but still not really a place to put it. That would take up about half, half of her closet, and then we'd have to get rid of some of those dresses. And for most of last year, Kelsey and I had a storage uh, facility, a storage, you know, storage unit in Danville, Virginia, because our house there did not sell until November. And once that happened, stuff we didn't have time to just go through everything up there. There was some stuff in the house too. So now our garage here is basically our house in Virginia boxed up. And our, our house here is two thirds the size of that house. So we have to figure out what to do. We, we haven't really taken all the time to sit down and go through things. So we need, need, either need to give it up or to donate it somewhere. We have more stuff then we have places to put the stuff. What we really need to do, though, probably is have less. Now, today's Bible story is about a man who had so much that he didn't know where to put it. But instead of accumulating his stuff, instead of buying it, his stuff he grew in his fields, and he stored it in his barns. The story is called The Parable of the Rich Fool. Now that kind of gives away the ending when you have it written, the parable of the rich fool, right before the story. But eventually Jesus didn't introduce the story by saying, hey, I'm going to tell you about this rich fool. He kind of let people figure it out. But anyway, from now until Easter, I'll be preaching on parables from Jesus in the book of Luke. The parables are stories that Jesus told that are sometimes confusing, sometimes offensive, sometimes outlandish. But in all of these stories... Jesus is making a point that draws us deeper into understanding of God and understanding of ourselves. Sometimes the parables were so vague that Jesus had to explain them. Sometimes he would just leave people hanging. Sometimes a lot of people were around him, sometimes only a few. Today's parable happened in front of a crowd. It's Luke 12, 13 through 21. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, open our ears, our minds, and our hearts to hear your word, to seek your will, to be moved to understand where you have given us blessings that overflow, called us to use them for your sake. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke 12, starting with verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And he told him a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will, I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, 
Fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The first verse of chapter 12, well before this story, tells us that so many thousands of people had gathered that they were trampling one another. Now regardless of where it was, it's not totally clear where Jesus was when this happened. Many people, many thousands gathering would have been a big noticeable thing. Jesus had been traveling around to smaller towns. Towns tended to be bunched kind of close together, but were very small. So even though Jesus was surrounded by thousands of people, those thousands were only from fairly limited spots. They probably would have been pretty familiar with each other, like people in small towns tend to be. I grew up in a small town, so I know. Now when I say I grew up in a small town, I need to emphasize to you that North Augusta is not a small town. North Augusta is more than five times the size of the town where I first grew up. If you think you know people's business here, people know one another's business here, try being in a town of 4,000 where there's nothing else for another 20 to 30 miles. Now I know some of you probably grew up in towns even smaller than that. In fact, the place where I grew up was so small that one of my best friends, Mark, lived on a farm downtown. He lived in a farm downtown. His family even had a big barn right there on the main road of town. I lived way on the other side of town, two and a half miles, clear on the other side of Tazewell. And that's about the distance from here to the Waffle House at exit one. The entire town fit in that area. For comparison, here's North Augusta. So that's, it would take about 53 minutes to walk to Waffle House from here. <laughs> and here's Tazewell, Virginia. So yeah, not a whole lot going on in Tazewell, Virginia. We used to just walk from Mark's house, and if we had the whole afternoon, we would just hike that mountain right there. We called it the peak, and then go down. It's kind of one of those stories about, you know, back, in, back when I was a kid, we could just walk around town whenever. And that's, that's the town that I lived in. Now, the towns in Jesus' day were a lot closer to the size of Tazewell, probably even smaller than North Augusta. So people knew each other's business. And whenever I hear this parable, I think about Mark's family in that barn that they had on the main road. And we used to play in the barn, and we'd walk around downtown. But the first time I realized that people knew who everyone was in a small town, I was staying over at Mark's house, a bunch of, bunch of boys for a sleepover. It was 1989, and Mark's dad drove us to the cinema and dropped us off to see Batman. The Batman with Michael Keaton as Batman and Jack Nicholson as the Joker. Well, some of our friends were already at the front of the line. So we just gave them our money and they bought our tickets and we went in and saw the movie. After the movie, Mark's dad picked us up in their 15-passenger van because Mark had four brothers and sisters. And he got us home and made us sit in the hallway. Now Mark's dad, the Honorable Frederick Harmon Combs II, stood about 6'5 and had big thick glasses. He glared down at us and said, I'm very disappointed in you boys. You all embarrassed me tonight, and you're lucky Elena, Mark's mom, held me back or I would have gotten out of the van and taken my belt and whipped each one of you right there in the parking lot. And we were all shocked. And Judge Combs had to explain to us that everyone in that line knew who he was. And they all saw a bunch of boys get out of his van and skip the line. We didn't know who anyone in the line was, but they all knew who Mark's dad was. That wasn't a surprise because Fred was one of the most well-known and most generous people in town. Sometimes if the high school football team won a big game, he would go to the press box and he would have the announcer tell the entire stadium that everyone was invited to the Combs house for a party afterward. One room in the house was painted white, and after Taswell won the state championship in 1986, he bought a bunch of markers 
And he had everyone in town come and sign the walls of that room. That was a small town. And that was a very generous man. Someone who knew how to share what God had given him. So you might ask why this parable makes me think of Judge Combs. Because he was nothing like the man in the parable. Other than the fact that they both had a barn. Well, Judge Combs retired in July of 2005. And... The retirement plans were to work the farm, and he and Elena were going to travel a lot. But on the first week of August 2005, Fred was on his tractor, and the lift malfunctioned, and the hay bale he was picking up somehow fell off and crushed him. And he died a few days later after they found matches for his organs. And it was front page news in the next town over, even across state lines. I managed to find that this week. And interestingly, in the bottom right, you see the other headline, Tazewell officials seek authority to pick up stray cats. The, uh, the Combs had like 15 cats around their house at any one time. They, I think the reason they had to pick up the stray cats was because Fred wasn't, wasn't taking in the cats anymore. Um, but when I, 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 I wept for the city, for the town of Tazewell, just because he was such a generous figure in the town. So Fred was a lot different from the man in Jesus' parable. And I'm sure we've all known people close to us, uh, heartbreakingly close to us, for whom a story like that has been the case. And this parable has a dark ending. But the parable is about more than just a greedy man who died. In fact, all parables are more than about the characters in them. Parables are about God and us. And this one is about how we focus our lives. Other than Jesus, there are two characters in this Bible passage. There's the man who made the request of Jesus, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me, and the guy in the parable who wanted to build barns. So let's first look at the guy who made the request. He said, teacher, tell my brother to to divide the inheritance with me. Where does this question come from? Jesus was not talking about inheritance. In fact, right before this, Jesus said something pretty profound. Luke 12, 4 through 12, Jesus says, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body, and after that have nothing more they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has authority to cast you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man also will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. That is some profound and heavy stuff. And as you can imagine, the crowd has probably gone silent for a moment trying to ponder and do some soul-searching about what Jesus had just said. This is what we would call a weighty silence. But in that weighty silence comes the shrill voice of someone who did not recognize the moment. After Jesus had made some of the most profound statements he had ever made, a guy in the crowd pipes up, Hey Jesus, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Huh? Jesus is talking about persecution and perseverance and faithfulness. And this guy wants him to settle a quarrel with his brother. Where did that question come from? Well, Jesus had an an appropriate response. He says, man, not the most cordial way to address someone, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? Basically, Jesus says, what business of that is mine? What business is that of mine? Now, to be fair to the guy, it's Jesus. So, 
You could argue that everything is his business, and he is the ultimate judge. He's also a teacher, and rabbis were authorized to settle disputes like this. But still, Jesus is telling people the way to salvation and eternal life, and this guy breaks into the moment with his own family squabbles. So sure, the guy asks Jesus to settle a dispute. But we might want to consider, why is the guy asking Jesus? If rabbis are authorized to settle disputes, why can't he just go to his local rabbi? Instead of relying on a teacher who's just passing through town. In fact, even before going to the local rabbi, a person in that time would have taken his dispute to the elders of the town. This would have been a big deal. Two brothers are at odds. The future of an estate is at stake. An estate that had been one of the largest in the area, probably. If it had gotten to the point of one brother wanting to divide the inheritance, then it was something that the elders of the town would have been talking about for quite a while. In fact, it probably was something that they had talked about for quite a while. Something they had probably already decided. And clearly they had not decided in favor of this man in the crowd because he was asking Jesus. If mom says no, ask dad, right? So here's the thing. Everybody in this crowd, the thousands of people from the little towns, would have known what was going on with this guy. There weren't going to be many families in the area wealthy enough to split an inheritance. And a conflict between brothers of one of these families would have been the talk of the area. This guy was going to Jesus with his question because he had not gotten the answer that he wanted from anyone else. So he thought this new rabbi just passing through town talking about forgiveness might give him a shot. It might put everybody else in their place. That's why the man could ask this kind of question after what Jesus had said. He wasn't listening to Jesus at all. He didn't come out to hear Jesus. He came out to get Jesus to take his side. But Jesus wasn't going to step into a situation that had clearly been resolved at the local level. Jesus might as well have said, Who made me a judge and arbiter over you when I just got here and everybody else knows your business. This man's only ally was himself. So Jesus told the crowd a parable about a man whose only ally was himself. It wasn't the man, answer the man had been looking for. Probably wasn't even the answer his brother had been looking for either. Right before the parable, but after the man's question, Jesus gives a warning. Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Now, D Jesus doesn't warn against possessions. He warns against covetousness or greed and against the way that we define our lives by what we have. And he says, for example, there's a man who had a bump bumper crop. Actually, Jesus says the land of a rich man produced plentifully. Uh, the New International Version says the ground yielded an abundant harvest. What yielded an abundant harvest? The ground. Not the man. So who yielded an abundant harvest? God. Not the man. So the man had a problem, but it was a good problem to have. So he consulted his greatest advisor, the highest power he knew, himself. Jesus says, he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. The word thought literally means he dialogued with himself. God had given him the harvest, but he only consulted himself. He didn't even consult his family or the town elders or a local rabbi. But he does have a problem. He's got a surplus of grain, and he doesn't know what to do with it. His barns aren't big enough to store it. So on the advice of himself, he decides he's going to tear down his barns and build bigger barns. Now how's he going to do that? Alone? It takes a lot of people to tear down and raise a barn. But it still doesn't click with this guy because he's not really thinking about the barns. He's thinking farther into the future than that. 
And again, he reveals his attitude. And he said, verse 18, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. So once again, who's he talking to? He's talking to himself. Even in his dreams about the future, the only person he's talking to is himself. And his big goal is to have so much stored up that he doesn't have to worry about it again. Never mind that he already has a barn and plenty of fields that could continue to produce. I guess he just wanted to store up and fire all of his workers and let the fields go fallow so he could be comfortable and not worry about being responsible for giving other people jobs or having enough food for others. But then God shows up and has the last word. You fool. Don't you know that your life will be demanded of you this night? And then who will get what you've accumulated? Now, I don't think any one of us is quite as self-centered as this guy, but that's not the point. Nobody in that crowd, not even the man who asked Jesus the question, was as selfish as the guy in the parable. We're all a little bit selfish, at least, from time to time. And Jesus tells us this story of an extreme case to uncover the errors of our thinking. In fact, our day, in our day and age, we could probably read this parable, and if God didn't come and say, you fool, at the end, we might not be that thrown off by the man's line of thinking. About 14, 15 years ago, my, my cousin and dad told me this story because they were there. The moderator of another Presbyterian denomination, was preaching at a conference, and he was talking about what inspired him. And he said, I, I looked around my community, and I saw these people in need, and I said to myself, God, how could this happen? Did you catch that? I said to myself, God, how could you let this happen? Well, it's easy to do, Right? We have so much and so many decisions to make that we end up forgetting who to consult. We end up thinking that our decision is God's decision because He's given us, even if we acknowledge He's given us what we have, we might still just assume that means it's our decision, not His. So what should the man have done? Twice in this parable, the man asks himself what he should do. That probably sounds like nothing to us today, but it would have been a shock to this crowd. If he's got a problem, he needs to go to the elders. Then maybe to the rabbi if they need to break a tie. The elders probably would have told him, okay, you've got all this, so give some to those in need who, who didn't have a good year. Um, share some with the synagogue. Uh, share some for the festivals, the religious festivals that we have. If you've got some more, then let's have a big banquet. Let's have a celebration. Then if you have some more, yes, let's build bigger barns. Actually, you could probably rent out some storage space in your bigger barns for others too. The man's bounty had come from God, not anything else that he did. If he had a surplus afterward, then sure, tear down the barns. That's God's message to build bigger barns. And even a barn raising would have been a huge party. But he wasn't thinking about that. He was only thinking about where's this going to get me in the long run? Security and comfort. His goals were security and comfort. And let's be honest, you can never have too much security and comfort. We always want more security, but there's really nothing as true, nothing there's no such thing as true, complete security. There's always another measure to take. You've always got to download another security update. There's always another barn to build to keep safe what you've got. If we believe that our lives are about comfort and security, or if everything is oriented toward those, then we're never going to be satisfied because there's always going to be another level to attain. So this guy had a lot of problems. He needed places to put stuff. He needed more security in the future to ensure 
his comfort, more money, more problems. If your biggest problem is finding places to put stuff, though, then that's not your biggest problem. If, you, if your biggest problem relates to your own comfort, then that's not your biggest problem. There's a spiritual problem deeper than any material problem that might be visible. Just like any other idol, the need for comfort and security can never be fully quenched. If you ever find yourself getting upset about a material problem, then it would be worth asking if there is a spiritual issue underneath it. This man's real issue was where he was oriented. Because if he was oriented toward God, the one who had given him what he had, then he'd have had no problem joyfully figuring out what to do with his abundance. But he was concerned about the security of his own stuff. But really, how much security out there can make us secure in here or in here? We live in a scary world, and the motivations of the man who asked the question and the man in the parable are probably familiar to us. The man who asked the question about dividing the inheritance, that's something that we see as just totally normal. If the inheritance is divided fairly, then it's easier for everyone to control. It makes a lot less drama in the long run. Believe me, we've got, in my family, we've got a mountain house that my grandmother gave to my dad and his three siblings, and it's a real headache sometimes. When the man in the parable wants to ensure his own long-term security, that's what we do too. Maybe he planned on letting the fields go fallow, but he still had fields. They could have kept producing. He could have replanted them when he ran into a crisis. And we don't always have you know, certainty that we're going to have a job or something like that, but you know, the wealth for this man in that time was something that the next year, by God's blessing, could produce just as much. But he wanted to shut all that down. He was willing to just shut everything down and not even have enough to share in the future, a year, two years, three years from then. When Jesus asks, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? The word arbitrator is actually divide. The man asks, divide the inheritance between my brother and me. Jesus said, who made me a divider over you? See, Jesus was also making the point that he is not a divider. He is a reconciler. The man came to ask Jesus to permanently divide him from his brother. Normally they would have shared the land, shared the crops, lived on it together, raised their families together. But he wanted permanent division from his family. And in Jesus' eyes, that is the real cause of poverty. In cultures around the world, having more usually means being more withdrawn. But with Jesus, having more should mean engaging more, crossing divides, looking for reconciliation with the gifts that God has given. The man who asked the question and the man in the parable, both of them were seeking isolation. When if they had been working with an idea of God's abundance and grace and mercy, they would have used what was given to seek reconciliation, restoration. And in the long run, reconciliation is much more secure than material security. In the long run, when we wonder about the future, we may wonder what we will have, but we know that even more important is who we will have. After all, Jesus would give up all of his comfort and security so that we can be reconciled to God. All of his own comfort and security on the cross so that he may have us and we may have him. So what was the man in the parable's biggest problem? He was isolated. And he couldn't think outside of his isolation. What was the man who asked the question's biggest problem? 
He was estranged from his brother, really estranged from the town as well, and he couldn't think outside the path of that estrangement to the one in whom they could be bound together. But for each of them, whatever was given to them was not their own thing to hold and to secure, but God's gift to use for His glory. They may have been holding a lot, but everybody is a stockholder in God. So the point is in reconciliation. When God provides, we have the opportunity not to pull away, but to draw near. Jesus uses wealth financial wealth or wealth in crops and land to tell the story, but this goes for any gift that God has given us. Even if our barns are not full of grain or our barns are not full of money, our barns might be full of time or of love or of perception or the ability to listen, to sit with one another, to be generous with something else, another gift in our lives. If we have those full barns, are we listening First, to God for how to use them? Are we overflowing with them? And when we approach Jesus, when we do seek His will, are we going to Him in order to listen? Or are we like the guy who asked the question, are we going in order to tell Jesus to affirm what we want to do? Are we willing to get an answer that's different than the one that we might want in that case? You know, sometimes in life with some things that God has provided, maybe our containers are just right. Maybe our barns are just right, where we have enough in case of emergency, enough to share. Maybe our barns aren't full and we need to ask God to fill our barns or at least open our eyes to where we are overflowing and what we can use for His sake. What container, what barn has God given us? What gifts has God given us to fill our lives? What are we overflowing in that we can use for His reconciliation? You know, this Wednesday, I guess Tuesday night technically, begins the season of Lent, and Presbyterians were always kind of in the middle on these sorts of church holidays. Uh, Sometimes we observe and acknowledge and Sometimes we just kind of let that be for the more formal churches. But uh, if you've celebrated Lent at any point in your life, you've probably gone through the practice of giving something up for Lent. And I think last year I talked about the practice of adding something. A lot of people want to add a practice. Maybe uh, be more disciplined about reading Scripture or be more disciplined in prayer or uh, find a prayer partner for Lent. It's a season where we acknowledge who God is, what He's given, and quite often try to pare down to just what is essential. Maybe for Lent this year, we can consider where we might be overflowing. We consider where God has given us things that fill more than just our own barns and can be used for someone else, can be tools for reconciliation an abundance of joy, an abundance of time, an abundance of understanding or patience or some kind of gift. So let's go to God now, asking Him to show us what to do with that abundance. Not just telling Him what we want done, but asking Him to fill us where we are empty and letting us overflow where we are full. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we probably all have places in our lives where we feel like we are coming short. and We may not be able to see the places where you have given us abundance. Help us to recognize those. Help us to pursue your will through them find reconciliation with our brothers and sisters and neighbors. Help us to see the resources we have as tools that demonstrate your grace. Help us to follow in the steps of the one whom you have sent to set aside his own comfort and security, all that he has, 
so that he may have us, so that we may be restored to him. We pray these things in his name, the name of Jesus.